His name is one of the first that comes to mind when you think about the alley-oop. One of the most ferocious dunkers of all time, whose aerial ability wowed fans for 13 seasons. Before Carter, Kobe, or Ryder were doing between the legs dunks, it was Orlando Woolridge busting that out in the first official NBA dunk contest in 1984. And when the games counted, Woolridge could put up points in a hurry with his freakish athleticism as he would show by averaging 20 or more points in multiple seasons. He provided excitement for a pre-Jordan Chicago Bulls team until Jordan came along and outshined everybody. He was a great bench player for the tail end of the Showtime Lakers and even spent one very memorable season in Denver. Orlando Woolridge would have his struggles, both on and off the court, but his maturity and accountability to address his off the court issues just speak to who he was as a person and not just a player. He got left behind in the mid 90s as he wasn't able to adjust to an evolving league, but at that point he was 34 years old and had played a more respectable career than most. And that career is what we're going to focus on today as we jog your memory for the late, great Orlando Woolridge. Orlando Woolridge attended Mansfield High School in his hometown of Mansfield, Louisiana. After high school, Woolridge chose to attend Notre Dame and play for the Fighting Irish under coach Digger Phelps. Woolridge was part of a freshman class which included fellow standouts and future NBA players in Kelly Trapuca and Tracy Jackson. On top of these three, the Fighting Irish were already loaded with future NBA talent, including players such as Bill Lambeer. Woolridge would play a modest but important role for the greatest Fighting Irish team in program history, as the 1978 team remains the only Notre Dame men's basketball team to reach the Final Four where they would lose to Duke 90-86, then unfortunately lose to Arkansas by two in the third place game as well. Orlando saw about 10 minutes per game his freshman season and put up averages of about four points, two rebounds, and half an assist per game, while shooting over 52%. Woolridge would start and play in every game of the 1979 season. He would raise his averages in every category and shoot over 57% from the field. Notre Dame had lost their top two scores from the previous year, but Trapuca, Jackson, and Woolridge filled in as the team's top three scorers. Notre Dame had a good season, but the team couldn't make the same impact as the previous year, as they went 24-6 and and were beat by eventual national champion Michigan State in the Sweet 16. But there's really never any shame in getting beat by Magic Johnson. Unfortunately, Woolridge struggled in this game, as he shot just one of six from the field and finished with three points. And for the regular season, Woolridge averaged about 11 points, five rebounds, and one and a half assists per game. 1980 involved Woolridge in an unfamiliar position, as he spent this year primarily playing center, which would help him shoot over 58% from the field and see him average a career high in rebounds and blocks. Woolridge would again be the team's third leading scorer behind Trapuca and Jackson, and would help the team finish 22-6. But their tournament run was short-lived, as Missouri knocked them out in the second round. Woolridge would have a good game though, as he put up 16-7 on over 66% shooting. And for the regular season, he would average about 12 points, 7 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. The 1981 season was Woolridge's best as he would be the team's second leading scorer behind only Trapuca. Him and the Fighting Irish would also have some memorable moments this year, as they would beat two top-ranked teams. First, they beat Kentucky at Freedom Hall on December 27th. Then, on November 11th, they would beat Ralph Sampson and number one ranked Virginia by one point after Woolridge hit a fallaway shot in the final seconds. This upset would end Virginia's 28-game win streak. The Irish would finish 23-6 and, and beat James Madison in the second round of the tournament in a game where Woolridge would only score 5 points on 1 of 4 shooting. The Sweet 16 pitted Notre Dame against Danny Ainge and BYU. This was a hard-fought game and it seemed as though Notre Dame may have sealed it when Topeka hit a go-ahead shot with under 10 seconds left. However, Ainge would drive the length of the court and hit a game-winning layup with just a couple seconds left. And although it was a heartbreaking loss, Woolridge performed great as he finished with 17 points on 80% shooting. And for the regular season, Woolridge would average about 14.5 points, 6 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game, on an absurd 65% from the field. Woolridge declared for the NBA draft following his senior season, and was picked ahead of his teammate Trapuca, and the man that probably haunted his dreams, Danny Ainge, as he was chosen by the Chicago Bulls 6th overall. The Bulls were coming off an Eastern Conference semifinals appearance and were bringing back all their main pieces, so it seemed that Woolridge's addition would only improve a playoff contending team. Woolridge would miss the first five games of the season as he was holding out for a better contract, and on November 6th he would agree to a five-year contract worth around $300,000 per year. However, the Bulls struggled to a 19-32 start and never recovered as they finished 34-48. and It is worth mentioning that they had three different coaches throughout the season, and Larry Keenan's body started breaking down as he would only play in 60 games at a fraction of his usual career minutes per game. Woolridge didn't have a huge role on the team, but he got his opportunities, as he saw action in 75 games and started 12. 
and he would average about 7 points, 3 rebounds, and 1 assist per game while shooting over 51%. 1983 saw a worse Bulls team, as they were missing a big inside presence, as the 8th train had been traded to San Antonio in the offseason, and the Bulls would finish 28-54. and This season would also see the Bulls coached by Paul Westhead, and they would score 111 points per game, which would be foreshadowing for one of Woolridge's career stops down the line. Woolridge would only play 57 games, but he would make big leaps in his second year, as he raised his averages to about 16.5 points, 5 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game, while leading his team in field goal percentage at 58%. 1984 would be the first and last season of Woolridge being the team's star and leading scorer, but this fact may have been different had Reggie Theus, who was coming off averaging a career high in points the year before, not been benched halfway through the season by new coach Kevin Loggery due to defensive inadequacies. Which was ironic, as Woolridge wasn't really known as an elite defender either, but I guess he did provide a unique blend of size and athleticism. Nonetheless, the Bulls finished 27-55 and, and missed the playoffs. Woolridge would also participate in the first official NBA dunk contest, where he performed the first between-the-legs dunk in dunk contest history. And for the regular season, he would average about 19.5 points, 5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. But luckily for the Bulls, they would land the third pick in arguably the greatest draft of all time. The Bulls would choose a 6'6 shooting guard out of North Carolina, but we all know how his career panned out. Woolridge would team with Jordan to become one half of the exciting high-flying duo nicknamed the Net Busters. Jordan would immediately become the team star and average about 28-6-6 six six in his rookie season. Unfortunately, this overshadowed one of the best seasons of Woolridge's career as he put up career numbers on efficient shooting and was the team's second leading scorer. Both Woolridge and Jordan would also participate in the dunk contest this year. And after finishing 38-44, and 44, the Bulls would find themselves in the playoffs as a 7th seed, where they would lose to the Bucks in 4. Even though Jordan stole the show with an incredible playoff series, Woolridge wasn't far behind and averaged over 20 points on 50% shooting for the series. He would also have his playoff career high of 28 in Game 3. It was an exciting time in Chicago, and Woolridge was a big part of that, as he averaged about 23 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. The 1986 season began looking like there would be an abundance of scoring in Chicago, as on top of Jordan and Woolridge, the Bulls traded for a legendary scorer in the aging George Gervin right before the season. Unfortunately, Jordan would break his foot in the third game of the year and go on to miss 64 games, which benefited Gervin as he got to start to fill in for Jordan and would finish third on the team in scoring. Woolridge finished second on the team in scoring, but we'll say he finished first because Jordan only played 18 games. So, Woolridge played 70 games as the team's primary option for the year, and while it wasn't pretty, the Bulls' 30-52 and 52 finish was enough to get them into the playoffs to play one of the greatest teams of all time in the 86 Boston Celtics. Although the Celtics swept them, this would be the legendary playoff performance that saw Jordan score 49 in Game 1 and then follow that up with 63 in Game 2. But this video is about Woolridge, and he had a solid performance as far as his scoring totals, but he was not as efficient as usual as his 21 points per game came on about 40% shooting. For the regular season, he would average around 21 points, 5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Woolridge would also score a career-high 44 points in a January 25th win versus Phoenix. The Bulls chose not to re-sign Woolridge as his playstyle was not a good complement to Jordan's. So Woolridge would sign with New Jersey and would spend the 87 season playing in 75 games and being the team's leading scorer. Woolridge's athleticism and size made it relatively easy for him to get his points but he had a one-dimensional game, as he wasn't a great shooter and didn't love playing defense. So it was difficult to win with him as your primary option. And this showed with the Nets, as they finished 24-58 and 58 and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Woolridge would average around 21 points, 5 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game. The 1988 season began with Woolridge starting for the Nets, but putting up his lowest scoring average since his rookie year. The Nets were again playing poorly and would end up finishing the year 19-63. and 63. This year would be an eye-opening period of Woolridge's life, as he came clean about a substance abuse problem, which had gotten out of control after Woolridge had missed the team bus to Philadelphia on February 17, 1988, at which point he decided to drive to Philadelphia under the influence, where he would drive his Jeep off the road. Then on February 18th, he would go to the hospital and be diagnosed with a concussion, but failed to notify the Nets until 6.30pm, which was 30 minutes after he was expected to report for a home game against Seattle. After this was deemed that he essentially disappeared for two days and missed two games, Woolridge admitted to the league office that he had an addiction problem, and he was admitted to a rehabilitation program. Woolridge's last game of the 88 season would be on February 15th, and in the 19 games he played for the Nets this year, he would average about 16.5 points, 
five rebounds, and three and a half assists per game. Woolridge would be ready for the 89 season and would sign with the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers, who were in the final years of their Showtime era. Woolridge's character and commitment would be tested as he had to earn his spot and the trust of the team by playing a bench role. Woolridge was expected to play the same type of role as Bob McAdoo in the early 80s, but he had trouble adjusting to this and really struggled to begin his tenure with the Lakers. Pat Riley would say in an LA Times article that Woolridge shot 30% for 37 straight games this season, and I checked that and that wasn't true. But he did have quite a few rough games and shot the lowest field goal percentage of his career outside of the 88 rehab season. Woolridge would also acknowledge that it took a while for him to feel fluid on the court after essentially taking a full year away from basketball. Woolridge would still see playing time in 74 games for an elite Lakers team that finished 57 and 25. Woolridge would have a slow start in the playoffs as he averaged under 4 points in round 1 versus Portland and under 8 points in round 2 versus Seattle. But then he averaged 10 points across the Western Conference and NBA Finals versus Phoenix and Detroit respectively. The health of the Lakers was bad coming into the NBA Finals as Byron Scott had a strained hamstring. And then in Game 2, Magic would strain his hamstring and only play 5 minutes in Games 3 and 4 in a series that would end in a sweep by the Bad Boy Pistons which meant Woolridge fell short in what would be the closest he would get to a ring in his career. But for the regular season, Woolridge would average about 10 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. The 1990 Lakers were quite similar, with the exception of one missing piece, as their franchise staple and center for the past 14 years had retired after 20 total seasons and over 38,000 points, and was replaced by rookie Vlade Divac. But the Lakers still had Magic, Worthy, and the rest of the supporting cast, and had an even better regular season than the year prior as they finished 63-19, and 19, which was the best record in the league. Woolridge began the season recovering from knee surgery, but would come back to play 62 games, still in a bench role, but receive almost 3 more minutes per game, and translate that to 3 more points per game, on very efficient shooting. Woolridge would also make much larger contributions in the playoffs than he did the previous year, but the playoffs would end in disappointment for the Lakers, as they were upset by the Phoenix Suns in the second round. And for the regular season, Woolridge averaged about 12.5 points, 3 rebounds, and one and a half assists per game. In the offseason, the Lakers wanted to sign Sam Perkins, so they pretty much gave away Woolridge to the Denver Nuggets to free up cap space. Okay, so remember how I said Paul Westhead coaching the Bulls was foreshadowing? This is what I was talking about. Westhead was hired by the Nuggets after a lot of success at Loyola Marymount, where he had implemented a run and gun offense that saw the Lions be first in the nation in scoring for three straight seasons, but also either last or second last in points allowed. But it resulted in a lot more wins than losses, and the Nuggets front office hoped it could translate to the NBA. But, spoiler alert, it didn't. However, the 1991 Denver Nuggets, in my opinion, are one of the most fascinating teams in NBA history. So, the 91 Nuggets would be first in points scored, as they averaged 119.9 points per game, while making just 300 threes. And just for reference, the Kings were the highest scoring team of the 2023 season, at 120.7 points, but they made over 1,100 threes. And that whole no defense thing didn't really fly in the NBA, as the Enver Nuggets, as they would be affectionately known due to having no D, would allow nearly 131 points per game, in a season that was full of comical final scores, such as a season opening loss where the team set a record for highest point total in a regulation game, when the Warriors beat the Nuggets 162 to 158. Then a week later, the Nuggets would allow 107 first half points in a 173-143 loss to Phoenix. All in all, the Nuggets allowed at least 100 points in all 82 games, while allowing less than 110 just 3 times, and more than 150 on 9 separate occasions. Woolridge would have his most prolific season though, as he averaged over 25 points and was one half of a high scoring duo with point guard Michael Adams. It's worth mentioning that Woolridge and Adams missed 29 and 16 games respectively, so the Nuggets may have flirted with 30 wins if both were healthy all year. This would be the season that saw Woolridge's trademark goggles make their first appearance, as he suffered a detached retina in a December 15th game against the Suns and used the goggles to protect his eye. At the time of the injury, Woolridge was third in the league with 28 points per game, but when the season ended, Woolridge had averages of just over 25 points, 7 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. In August of 1991, Woolridge was traded to the Pistons for Scott Hastings, where he would be reunited with former Notre Dame teammate Bill Lambeer. Woolridge played a respectable starting role for the 92 Pistons, alongside most of the big contributors who swept him in the finals in 89, as he would finish third in the team in scoring on about 50% shooting. This would also be the first and only season of Woolridge's career where he would play in all 82 games. 
These Pistons were still an elite defensive team, but their offense was one of the worst in the league. But nonetheless, they would finish 48-34 and, and make the playoffs. In a competitive five-game series with the Knicks, the Pistons would ultimately lose 3-2, as Isaiah would struggle from the field, shooting under 34% for the series, and Dumars would score just 12 points in the series deciding Game 5. Woolridge saw a bit of a drop in his scoring, as he averaged 3 less points on 5% lower shooting from the field in what would be the last postseason of his career. And for the regular season, Woolridge would average about 14 points, 3 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. Woolridge would suit up for Detroit to begin the 93 season and would play 50 games for the team, still as a starter, putting up similar averages from the previous year. However, on February 25th, the Pistons would trade Woolridge to the Bucks for Alvin Robertson, as the Pistons lacked guard depth. Woolridge would play in just 8 games for the Bucks and never really find his fit in those 8 games, as he averaged below 6 points per game for a 28-54 Bucks team. And overall for the regular season, Woolridge would average about 12 points, 3 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. Woolridge would sign with the Sixers for the 94 season, where he would play 74 games in a 6th man role. Even at 34 years of age, Woolridge was still effective and provided a good scoring punch off the bench for a below average Sixers team who finished 25-57. and 57. Overall, he would finish the year with averages of about 12.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 7 assists per game, before finishing his career after this season. Woolridge would play a couple years overseas, and in 1995 would win the Italian Cup, Italian Super Cup, and FIBA European Cup, while winning MVP or top scorer of all three championships, while he was playing for Benetton Treviso, and he would also briefly coach the LA Sparks for a season and a half in the late 90s. Orlando Woolridge would have a very underrated career, which easily could have seen him out of the league after his 88 incident, but his response in the face of adversity kept him in the league and allowed him to experience his most team and individual success in the years after this incident. Basketball ran in the family for Woolridge, as his cousin was Nick's great Willis Reed, but Woolridge played a little more above the rim than the captain. It's too bad that Woolridge wasn't a consistent defender, as his length, athleticism, and agility, which was always on display in the offensive end, could have made him just as dominant on the defensive end. Additionally, his one-dimensional play that relied on athleticism could only work for him for so long, especially in a league that was evolving and seeing much more long-range shooting from guards and wing players in his final years. Something that was never part of Woolridge's game, evidenced by the fact that he took less than 100 threes over his 13 seasons and made less than 10 of them. But that's not to say that he couldn't shoot at all, as he did have an effective mid-range game and was a more than reliable free throw shooter at about 74% which served him well, as he was a master at getting to the line. But all in all, Woolridge was an athletic freak, who played an exciting brand of basketball and figured out a way to score, and to do it efficiently pretty much everywhere he went. And he overcame an addiction to essentially have a full second NBA career, after almost throwing it all away. And even though he reportedly came on hard times in his later years before passing away in 2012, he was reportedly also remembered by all those who were close to him as the most enjoyable person to be around. But that's it for today's episode on the high-flying Orlando Woolridge. Hope you enjoyed it and subscribe for more episodes. If you did like it, check out this playlist for plenty more videos like this one. Thanks for watching and see you next time.